you have your Bibles, if you would open them up to 1 Peter chapter 5. I come with no props. I feel like I need to find some. But we're going to be diving into the verses that Pastor Eric kind of gave us a foretaste of. And as we look at these verses, these are very, very serious verses, very important verses in the life of the believer. And I will, I will say this, as we have uh, spent time over the last several weeks, uh, we have been scratching the surface in every one of these topics, whether that's the, the role and number of elders, whether that is the role and responsibility of a congregation and the hum humbleness that we need to have, the humility that is required, and what does that look like just in general? What is humility and how does that work? And then now we're going to kind of turn and talk a little bit about that spiritual warfare that is very real. In all of these, we could spend, and there are books that have been written ad infinitum on all of these topics. And as we have just kind of scratched the surface, I'll probably come back around to some of these things and continue to discuss them and see what God has to say for us. But we now will dive in. So if you have your place, we're going to read 8 and 9 once again, just so we have his word. Would you stand as we read? God's word says this. Be of sober spirit. Be on alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. You pray with me. Father, I ask as we dive into your word that you would allow us to hear today. You would give us grace to be able to receive your word. And you would give us faith eyes to be able to see things that are not necessarily physical in nature. Lord, we desire spiritual truth. We desire spiritual insight. We desire to understand what goes on in the spiritual realm. That we might better understand who you are and how you work. That we may not be found not alert to the things that are going on around us. And so, Lord, I pray that as we dive into this, that you would open us to what you have to say. Thank you for your word and for this time together to study, to sit under, and to hear you speak. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. First thing right off the bat, I just want to say this. As we confront difficult, significant issues, there's always going to be an enemy that wants to see us implode or destroyed. Over the last several weeks, like I said, we've been talking about critical issues, real issues that determine how we operate. If you really look at the end of chapter 4, about verse 17 and beyond, he kind of transitions to this high calling of the church and the responsibility of the church to live like people of God in this world. And he talks about the relationship between those who are in the church and how that is to function. And then you throw on top of that all the external suffering, all the trials, the tribulation, the perseverance, or the persecution that they face whether they're just being human or because they're identifying with Christ, and you know that it can be really tough living all of this out. This is hard. There are times where I get so overwhelmed by it. If you've ever done this, I've, I've gone outside, and sometimes I'll just stare at the sky, and I'll look at the moon. And I don't, I, I've always been fascinated with space ever since I was a little kid. And I took classes in college and learned all kinds of neat stuff about space. But one thing I love about the moon is, number one, it's right there, and I can stare at it. I don't have to have a you know, telescope to look at it. I can see it. But then beyond that is there's nobody there. It's just quiet. In fact, if you wanted to make noise, you really couldn't because there's not really enough air to be able to move the molecules around to even be able to get the sound going. Couldn't breathe either, but... With the mask, we challenge, we're challenged here as well. 
And sometimes there's just that time where you're, man, this is just hard, right? It's just not easy. There's just so much being thrown at us. And how do we deal with all of that? What do we do with that? And I will tell you, it is in some of the most trying of moments, moments that are difficult, ones that demand so much of us, that we have two options. Either we turn and rely on God, or we expose ourselves to an enemy attack that can be very costly. And so as Peter has been speaking about these things, he has called us to this right relationship, this right way of living, even in the midst of all of this. And even as he lets us turn all these things over in verse 7, right, casting your cares upon him who cares for us, he turns immediately and reminds us that we still are involved. Look at these commands. It says, be of sober spirit. Um, my uh, Bible dictionary, I love what it says. It says, being self-possessed under all circumstances. It means you're not out of control, as Pastor Eric was alluding to. It's you're, you're composed. You're seeing those different moments as opportunities to be composed in them. And then be on alert. It literally means just to be or to keep awake. And for some of us, that's, that's hard enough as it is. But then beyond that, it means to be spiritually those ways, to be spiritually alert. And for some of us, we don't even recognize when we are asleep, right? If you've ever been there when you're reading a book and you find yourself, you've read the line seven times and you still don't know what it says? Or somehow you're reading and all of a sudden there's this whole story, movie in your brain that's going on and you've totally left the book. Sometimes spiritually we can do that very easily. Being sober and on alert, these are words that call for keen attention, both to the things around us and in us. I'll tell you, when I get tired and worn down, I can get snippy. And one of the things that I know that I have to do, like when if I'm with my kids, I have to be really careful. The other day, Joseph looked at me, and I really think it was innocent. I don't think he was, like, complaining. And he said, Dad, when do you think the house is going to be done? And, you know, I was just in that moment where I was pushing hard, trying to get things done. And I'm like, in my brain, I'm going, do you not see all that I'm doing? And so I'm like, don't ask me that question. And I was, and I was like, I could see him go, ooh, like I hit a nerve, Dad. And so I started backtracking really fast, trying to, like, bring it around. Well, you know, actually, son, I've been working kind of hard, if you've noticed, and uh, it, it will be soon, and I promise we're going to get these things together, but I think it's probably about, you know, maybe a month away that we'll have most of the, most projects all the way done, and, but I can do that, right? You hit a nerve, and it just, it just comes, and we have to be alerted to how we are doing, it, both internally and externally, the things that we're facing, because we too often respond in a way that doesn't honor the Lord because we're not paying attention and we just let the flesh speak instead of being guided by the Spirit. Peter has just talked about humility and casting anxiety upon God. And you might think those are very passive things. But trusting in God and humbling ourselves before God doesn't withdraw us from the battle. It's important just because we say, well, it's not let go and let God, just, just this random whatever happens. We're, we are involved in this, and we are called to that. We are called to participate in what God is doing and how God is doing it and how we are responding in the midst of it. And there's a reason, because we have an adversary, the devil, prowling around like a roaring lion. An adversary, one who is against us, right? Think about this for just a second. Satan is ever set against you. He is never a true friend. He is always seeking to devour you. Like it's not like just a, a friendly banter. It's not just a, ha-ha, I got you off one time. It is always against us. He always seeks for the destruction of the people of God. Always set against the things of God. You know, it's interesting to me that Peter goes from humility into resisting Satan. Because it's the exact same thing that James does in James chapter 4. 
what he's talking in verse 6, he says, but God gives grace, a greater grace. Therefore, it says that God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And then he says, submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will free, flee from you. And I would imagine that the disciples, having walked around with Jesus for three years, having seen the spiritual battles that he's faced, the enemy that he has endured and he has conquered, that they very much have a spiritual eyes to be able to see. And they are looking out at this and they're going, man, humility and pride, that's the enemy. And they immediately go to this devil, this one who is so against us. And so for us, just a moment, let's take a time out. Who is the devil? Where did he come from? How does this work? But we have some clues given to us in Scripture, okay? So let's kind of look at it. If you have your Bibles and you go back to the Old Testament, the book of Ezekiel, chapter 28, you have a reference to the king of Tyre that is given. And when you start to read that reference in chapter 28, you find that that sounds a whole lot more like something more than just a, a human king, Listen as I start in verse 11. It says, And again the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation over the king of Tyre. So mourning what's happened to this king. And say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You had the seal of perfection. You were full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The ruby, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, the lapis lazuli, the tur tur turquoise, the emerald, and the gold, the workmanship of the settings and sockets was in you. And that sounds like an incredible being, whoever this is. And it says, on the day that you were created, they were prepared. And you were the anointed cherub, one of the high ruling angels who covers. And I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created. And then he says, until unrighteousness was found in you. By the abundance of your trade, you were infernally filled with violence, internally filled with violence, and you sinned. And therefore, I have caused you and cast you uh, and as profane from the uh, mountain of God. And I have destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. And so I cast you to the ground and put you before kings that they may see you. This image of this being is spectacular. Let's pull out some of the things. So he was, verse 15, he was a created being. So Satan is a created being. Verse, 20, uh, verse 12, he was originally perfect. He was an anointed cherub, but he became fallen. Isaiah speaks of him this way. He says, but you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will make myself like the Most High. So here is this enemy of ours who was created in majesty and beauty, and he let it go to his head. And he said, you know what? I'm just as good as God. I'll take his place. I'll sit on his throne. And he fell. And when he fell, he took a third of the angels with him. Now we call them demons. Revelation 12 gives us that hint. It says, this tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. He has many names, Lucifer, the devil, a dragon, evil one, the ancient serpent or the serpent of old, the tempter, Abaddon, Apollyon, Beelzebub, or Beelzebul, Belial, Be Belial. Uh, I always want to say it, I don't know how you would say it in English, but anyway, the God of this world or age, the prince of this world, the father of lies, like that's. Those are the names that he's known as all over Scripture. You see these different names that are put on this one character that we now address as Satan. But here's some other facts. He has certain doom ahead of him. God says he threw him down. Matthew 25 says that he will, he will one day be departed into an eternal fire that's been prepared for him and his angels. 
And here's something interesting. He doesn't reign in hell. He suffers there. Sometimes we get that picture of the character of the little, you know, Satan in hell, and he's holding his pitchfork, and he's like ruler over hell. He's not. He faces judgment and punishment there. He's not omnipresent. He's not omniscient. He's not all-powerful because he's not God. I do this illustration sometimes. I've done it with my youth when I was a youth minister, playing the opposites game, right? The opposites of, of black is white. The opposite of light is happy is good is bad. Okay, I would have gone evil, but that's pretty and ugly or pretty ugly, so one of the two. Heaven and God and, and that's the wrong answer. Because it's, it's not like it's a yin and yang where God is over here and, and there's the good, the good force and the bad force and God is duking it out and they're hoping to win in the end. It's this way, right? It's God above. Everything else is creature. Everything else is created. So it's God and everything else. That's how it works. And sometimes we elevate Satan to this, man, it's, it's who's going to win it at the end? The Bible has no problem with the winner. It's we who are deceived too often by the power of the enemy to think that he will win, that he has an upper hand. The reality is Job chapter 1 and 2 remind us that he is subservient to God, that everything that Satan does is in accord with and under the will of God. That's an amazing thought. Like one of my favorite verses about God's just absolute control over all things is in Acts chapter 2 where he talks about that God, according to his preordained plan, let his son be crucified by the hands of evil men. Like that, that, that he allows all of these things to work together and it's all under his control and Satan himself Everything that Satan is doing, has done, will ever do is in submission to God and his will. Satan can do nothing outside of what God lets him do. That's great. That's really great to know. Now, it doesn't mean that he's not still powerful. Doesn't mean he's not very crafty. It doesn't mean that he doesn't have control over this world, like Ephesians 2 points to us. Listen to 2 Timothy 2.26. It says, talking of the lost, it says that they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4 talking of those, again, the lost, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they may not see the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And one of the, one of the realities is if you're not in Christ, you're a slave to sin, and you're controlled and under the control of the world that is here whose head is Satan. God is using all of that to bring people to himself. But here is one who is doing things. And you hear the, the line, the devil made me do it, right? Well, for a believer, you can't say it because it says we've been set free. We just sang that song. But for the lost, I guess that's kind of theologically correct, which is kind of scary. But at the end of the day, we don't play the blame game either, right? Because when we give ourselves over to it, it's because we have chosen to do that and we, we are accountable for it. And every person who acts, acts of their own free choice to do those things. And that's an, an unbelievable thing. But now we have this also the spiritual realm where there's a ruler of demons. So you have this, this very real 
roaring lion who is powerful, who is controlling this world. And so Peter is saying, yeah, it's not easy. And you have an enemy that loves to steal, kill, and destroy. He loves to go at you. The New Testament is over and over, uh, gives us an understanding that there are not just Satan, but a lot of his henchmen that are working. We have over a hundred times uh, just demon and demons shows up just being used. The disciples had a, real, a very real understanding of it. They saw it. They saw Jesus remove a demon from a person. And man, in America, we, we have been almost convinced that there's not a spiritual world and that there's not a spiritual battle going on. And so we live this world and we think, well, what I see is reality. And we forget that there's a whole nother dynamic involved here. That there are forces that we are battling against that we aren't alert and we aren't sober to. And as a result, we are setting ourselves up for failure. And then there is this one more description. This prowling around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. The, the word here that's used for prowling, is, it just means to really just to go around. He's looking for, it's a, it's a way he lives, it's a way of life, it's his conduct. He roams looking for a, a victim to devour. Now, I, I have to say, I, I don't seem to see too many lions prowling and roaring at the same time. Right, you would think prowling would be the quiet, secretive. Um, if you remember the uh, the VBS song, the sneaky little snake in the sneaky little way, with the sneaky little smile and a sneaky little face. Sometimes we have him in that cute little picture. That's not the picture that Peter is presenting here. Peter is presenting an affront to believers that the enemy is there to destroy. We're not discussing his ability to be secretive or not. Instead, right now, we're looking at his nature to be destructive everywhere he goes. He is like a lion. All right, I looked up facts on lions. So lions, the roar can be heard up to five miles away. That, that really blows my mind. Uh, with Guy Tiki's hearing aids, maybe even six or seven. Five miles away, the vocal cords in a lion are formed in a square instead of a triangle. And it allows them to stabilize their vocal cords and enables them to roar without requiring the strain and the air pressure that we would need to accomplish the same thing. The roar does a couple things for the lion. It helps them to find other lions, I guess, if you're five miles away. Why not? Ed, where are you, right? <laughs> they better be able to hear, I guess, well, too. But then it also proclaims rulership over their territory. Due to the low frequency of the roar, they actually will use it in hunting because it will actually you'll feel the roar, and it will cause temporary paralysis. Because you're like, ooh, and in that moment, they pounce and destroy. It's a picture that Peter is trying to get across here. This is not an easy thing. This is not someone who is weak. This is not something that is to be taken lightly. Remember what's going on in the experience of the readers to whom Peter is writing. They're facing persecution. They're facing trying to live out community in the midst of trial. They're in the midst of moments that could be very fear-inducing. Right? They, they, like us, even in this moment, and in a lot of ways, we have become a culture that's driven by fear and responds to it. I mean, that's part of... I, I feel like at some point we've kind of built ourselves to this. Where kids talk, you know, you talk to parents of us, or when we were kids, you know, you had a child snugged up in the back of the car, laying across the back of it while they were driving down 75. Now, 
I think you have to be six foot tall before you're out of a child booster seat. Right? We used to ride bikes, helmets, knee pads, what? Now they're like required. It's like, oh, if you go out, make sure you have it on. I think we continue to foster fear. And the question is, what is our response to it? How do we live a life that looks at all the things that are going on and we become so inward, we, we panic and we pull away from? And that's exactly what he's saying here spiritually. It'd be so easy spiritually not to engage, not to do anything, just hunker down and hide. And yet he says, the word says, you are to be the light and the salt. You are to pierce the darkness. The darkness cannot overcome it. Hell cannot have its power over the church. And Peter's reminding us here, yeah, all of this is going on. But here is there, and there's an enemy that's, that's leading the charge against us. And it reminds us that living life well isn't a game. It is indeed warfare. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul writes about it. He says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. So we're destroying spec- speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. We're taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. That's why we come in and we sing worthy of worship, worthy of praise. Because we need to be reminded and let those things be taken captive to the power and authority and the goodness and the faithfulness of God. Ephesians chapter 6, finally be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against powers and against world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. So many times we think each other are the enemies. And that's when the enemy has truly deceived us into fighting against ourselves rather than against him. So how do we battle against a powerful, smart, roaring lion who seeks to utterly destroy us? Peter goes on to say, resist by your faith. And remember, others are doing the same. Verse 9 says, but resist him. It's an imperative. It's a command. It means to hold him off, to set oneself against, to oppose, to withstand, to stand one's ground. You see, we don't go on the attack. We don't go on the offense of looking for Satan like, hey, come find me. Let's fight. But when he comes, we are to stand our ground. When divinely permitted persecution comes, when the enemy comes at us, either personally or maybe through a demonic force or maybe through a circumstance, we stand our ground by being firm in our faith. So what does it mean to be firm in your faith? Well, number one, I think it means Hebrews 11.1. 1. It means knowing what you believe and continuing to believe it regardless of the circumstances, regardless of what you see. Right? Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. I would say it also means that we equip ourselves with truth so we can fend it off. Man, what did Jesus do when he was tempted? He responded to the enemy with truth, right? That's what Pastor Eric was alluding to. We've got to have that in us. Ephesians 6 goes on to say, Therefore, take up the full armor of God. Then he goes and says, Stand firm then, having girded your loins with the truth having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, taking to, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you'll be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows, i.e. the loud roars and attacks of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. Resisting isn't fleeing. It's standing your ground. It's 1 John 4, 4. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And knowing that that is true. There's an illustration in this passage, Ephesians chapter 6, where it talks about the armor, and you put all that armor on. Where is the unprotected place when you have all that armor on? Anybody know? 
right here. There's no armor mentioned to protect the back because we weren't designed and called to flee. We're called to stand firm and to resist. We believe that greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. And we take truth, and we take righteousness, and we take our salvation and the promises that we have, and we let those things fight on our behalf as we stand in their light. We resist by our faith. And then the second part is this. We know we're not alone in any of it, and that gives us encouragement and a reminder that help is near. He goes on to say, resist them in your faith, knowing that others are facing the same thing around the world. Knowing that, be aware that you're not alone. Man, so often the enemy wants to think we are alone. When we face trial and tribulation, we go and hide on our own. And we think, man, I'm the only one going through this. I'm the only one facing this. I'm the only one giving into this. I'm the only one challenged by this. I'm the only one tempted with this. And the enemy's saying, yeah, that's exactly right, so hide. And we're reminded that no, we are not alone. No temptation is overtaking us, but what is common to man, God is faithful. That they are experiencing the same experiences, the suffering that is being accomplished. Now, I looked at that word. That is not what I would have written. I would have wrote, like, that's being endured, that's being put up with, that's being survived through. No, but it says, it says the sufferings are being accomplished. The same experiences of suffering are being accomplished. It's a positive sense. God is doing something, even in the midst of trial, adversity, temptation. He's doing a work. In fact, that word is the same word that uh, Paul uses over in Philippians chapter 1 where he talks about those who um, he, be, or, uh, he began a good work in them will bring it to completion on the day of Christ. He who began a good work and you will bring it to completion on the day of Christ. That word completion, it's perfected. This idea that God is working through all of it. So again, it goes back to Hey, yeah, there's an enemy. He's more powerful than you. Here's an enemy that's roaring in this world. There's an enemy that we face as the people of God, and yet he is a pawn to produce in you your sanctification, your growth, and your dependence upon a God who is more powerful, more capable, more present, more everything than all of that. And the only way you get to learn how powerful God is is by seeing God work in the midst of difficult times. No pain, no gain. We know what beauty is. We know what darkness is because we know their opposites. We know what chaos and order are because we've seen and experienced them. We know what spiritual realities are because we face them and God works. And it says these other people in the world are suffering the same thing. I'm reminded of Hebrews chapter 11. I love Hebrews chapter 11. I love the end of it. What more can I say? For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, of Samuel, of the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, and put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by the resurrection, and others others were tortured, not accepting their release, so that they may obtain a better resurrection, while others experienced mocking and scourging, Yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were put to death with the sword. They were went out in sheepskin and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, men of whom the world was not worthy. 
wandering in deserts, mountains, caves, holes in the ground. All of these having gained approval through their faith. Man, what an opportunity we have. What a cloud of witnesses we have across this globe. You understand, Erlanger Baptist, that you are just part of the church. That there are people of God all around this globe. That there is a spiritual battle that is being raged. That there is an enemy trying to hold back the mustard seed. And yet, right here, you are evidence of God's power and God's grace to overcome. You're a picture of that right here. So be sober. Be alert. Yeah, there's an enemy, and he wants to devour. But what we'll talk about next week It's the next verses. Our God conquers all. We have hope because Jesus Christ went to the cross. And so the question is this morning, as we face this adversary, where are you? Where are you this morning? Are you running scared right now? Then I want to encourage you to come to Christ. Are you being devoured right now? You've given yourself over to a sin that you know is wrong, you have given yourself over to it, and you know it's time to just repent and give that back because the enemy is basically eating you from the inside out, swallowing you up, stealing you of all joy, all satisfaction. Or are you numb to all of it? I would then say the Bible says that you are being blinded by the enemy, and it's time that you would open your eyes to Jesus Christ. Because that same punishment that Satan will have one day in Matthew 24 in a place called hell is the same place he's trying to convince everybody else to go with him in any way he can. That's the offer of the gospel that we have, that the light shines through that darkness that you see there is a God who absolutely loves you. And even though this world has left that divinely perfect state when we walked away in sin and we face all the consequences of it in this world, yet in his love he pursues us through Jesus Christ. And there is no other way because this roaring lion can be defeated by nothing else and nothing short of the cross of Jesus Christ. And that's what has been conquered for you. That through Jesus Christ, the Son of God, coming, dying on a cross in your place, taking upon your sin, setting you free from sin, hell, death, and the grave, giving you the glory and the eternal reward of chapter 1 of 1 Peter. 1 Peter One, he talks about how great heaven is, and then he says right afterward, be sober. And now he's talked about all the persecution and the enemy that roars, and he says the same thing, be sober. Keep it all there. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Turn to Christ if you have never, and receive him today. Would you pray with me? Father, too often we live ignorant. We live with a caricature version. We live maybe in outright denial. That there is a world force and that there is a world enemy who reigns over this world. who, when the church is trying to even be the church, will try to sneak in either him or his demons and and mess things up in efforts to turn the people of God against themselves and to not live out the expression of the kingdom of God or to rend them powerless, that they would not be the law, the, the light and salt to the lost. Lord, to fight against, 
to weaken, to beat down. And yet, Lord, we know from your word that it's a very real battle that's being fought. But it is not fought at our loss. Because you have demonstrated your power through Jesus Christ. You have demonstrated your authority, even bringing him to this planet and allowing him to die on the cross in the exact way that you desire to do it. You demonstrate and you proclaim that you are God because you tell us the end from the beginning that soon, soon that enemy and all who have fought against you will face judgment. That the people of God will persevere because it is by your power and your power alone. And so, Lord, I pray for every person in this room. I pray for every person who's watching. I pray that you would be a God who would reveal yourself to them as the one who is good, the one who is good enough that we don't go outside of you, that we don't look for things that this enemy wants to throw at us and see them as those distractions, but we would lay them down, that we would turn from them, that we would recognize that this is not something trivial and light, but that we would be confronted by these things and see them with the same light and eyes that you see them yourself. God, I know that there's an enemy who would love to destroy me, my family, this church, this community, this nation, this world. God, may you, through me and my family, and this church, and this community, and this nation, and this world, demonstrate your power so that you would get glory that your people would find joy. And Lord, that we would be perfected as your word says, as we come to trust in you over this great fear. Because perfect love drives out fear. And that is who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.